excited about. Um, if you've got kids, please come. It's an amazing event that we do here at the church, and it, and it really does. This makes such a huge impact um, in their lives and in your lives as well. So let's jump into today's message. Today we're piggybacking on something that I kind of discovered as I was getting ready to talk about Father's Day last weekend, and this thing around family identity kind of came up. And um, it's something that I wanted to unpack, and it brought me back to a long time ago, a message that I heard probably 10, 15 years ago. There were some components to that message that actually changed uh, my trajectory in life. And, and that kind of surfaced back up in me, and, and God brought that kind of all together. And I thought, now I'm excited. I get a chance to then pass this along to you. But we're talking about family identity. And, and this here, I don't know if you guys have ever seen the game, uh, Awkward Family Photos. I don't know if anyone has seen or played that game, but it's basically because there's one fun person in the audience, so I don't know what the rest of you are doing, but it's basically a game centers around awkward family photos, and this is, this is one of those. So this is a real family photo, uh, which I could identify with. It's lots of mullets here in the screen. Um, so I, yeah, but this is part of that game. But what this did for me is this really helped me to kind of uh, put into words that every family is its own special sauce of different, right? Your, your family is really different from another person's family. Uh, you really start to understand this when you get married and two come together and those two come together and find out that now they have to share a family with the other family and they find out how weird that family actually is. And so around family identity, I kind of ask these two questions. Okay, what, what is your family known for? And then what do you know your family for? And so I'll tell you a little story. I think my wife is with my sick child, which is great because she's out of the room. So I can tell this story here. So when we first got married, uh, we went to the States. And when we went to the States, I had never met her family and we were already married and so we spend the first week in Knoxville with my parents, and we have Christmas there, and it's very relaxed. My parents are like me, relaxed, chilled. Um, Casey's like, wow, this is so relaxing. And she kept saying that over and over again. I'm like, well, what's your family like? She's not, not like this, you know? And so we left, and we went down to her family in Texas, and I think the first thing that Casey did to me was we visited her cousin, and her cousin had, I think they had 12 or 13 kids. I'm not sure. I think it was actually maybe three or four. It felt like 12 or 13. <laughs> they bought a barn and they stripped all the acoustics out of it and they just lined it with sheet metal and concrete. And then Casey and I sat in the middle of a, of a metal tomb while five to 12 kids ran around and screamed uncontrollably. And I sat there while Casey's trying to connect with family that she's not seen for six or seven years. And when we finally left, four hours later, I looked at her and I was mad. I said, do, do you just not love me? Do, is, that, is that why we stayed in there? Oh, she's here, she's in the back now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 13 kids, right? In that metal barn. So as we were leaving, I said, do you not love me? And she said, what, what are you talking about? Why were we there for four hours? I'm having like an anxiety attack. I'm like melting down in the car. And I started to realize that Casey's family was, was built different. Their identity, what they were known for was a little bit different. My family was known for being chilled and relaxed. And so we left from there and we, we go and we stay in with, uh, with more of her family. And, and the first time that I meet her grandmother, this amazing woman, absolutely absolutely amazing woman kind of the matriarch of the whole family and we meet and she's she's a, a lovely lovely woman and it's around just after Christmas time before New Year's and we're getting ready to go out and meet more of her family and she asks if we're hungry and she so she feeds me you know ham and turkey and and stuffing and I ate it and I didn't really feel good you know thought started feeling not so great and we end up at, at another family member's house. And in this house, there's a, a lady. I, you, you were all just jumping in here. Casey's got an Aunt Peggy. So an Aunt Peggy uh, was, <laughs> this is so complicated and hysterical. Okay, so we think Aunt Peggy was on drugs, but the, the, the cocaine and the alcohol were working together to keep Peggy pretty level. There was one guy in that house that I connected with super well, and his name was Steve. Well, I didn't know that Steve was her dealer. And so 
me and Steve are just on the couch. I, we're looking around and we're both like, these people are nuts. And I'm like, I know, tell me about it. And we leave. And I'm like, Steve was great. And Casey's like, did you ever notice why Peggy kept leaving the house and coming back in? And, you know, and I was like, yeah, that was a bit, a bit weird. This is also the same environment where they put pantyhose on their heads and filled with tennis balls at the end and they were swinging their heads trying to knock things over and <laughs> all of that I'm extremely sick I feel horrible and it's later I learned that Casey's grandmother that that dressing had been made you know six to seven months before and had been <laughs> stuck in the freezer and she'd been splitting the portions between people and then her dog at the same time so <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, the first time I met Casey's mom, she made me car sick. We had to pull over on the side of the road uh, so that I could throw up in a Holiday Inn parking lot. So this is all Casey's family. And, 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 this is, and I'm thinking, what on earth is this? This, this is what they're, they're known for being a little crazy. Now, they love loud. They love big. They're wonderful, wonderful, amazing people. They, they really are. Steve is actually still in the picture. He's still my, my favorite. But... <laughs> But they, they're a great family, and they're known for, be, for loving loud and, and being loud and having fun and playing games, and Casey's grandmother is known for, for celebrating life and always bringing people into that life, and it really is an incredible thing. What, what I got to do is when I got to meet their family identity, when I got to meet them, not only did I meet sort of them or, or did, was I married now to Casey, but I actually got to meet the entire family tree. And so when we, when we look at our, we all have this family tree, these kind of branches of, of family that branch off aunts and uncles and all of that stuff. And, and all in one super dose, I just met the entire tree all on one single trip. And that started to get me a little bit worried because there's this truth here that the apple does not fall far <laughs> from the family tree. And so for about a year, I'm watching my wife, what is, you know, are you going to, how's this going to, no, she's great. But in all honesty, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. You're going to become what has been modeled before you. So guys, if you're dating somebody, maybe you're in high school or, uh, you know, younger than that, older than that, you're, you're dating somebody and you want to know what they're going to be like in 10 years, 12 years, 15 years, five years, whenever it is, just look one level up in that family tree. And that's more than likely who they're going to become. You know, there's also this moment in, in every life around my age, you know, I just turned 40 and, and it's happening more and more and more often. I have these moments where I realize, oh my word, I am my father, you know, <laughs> and growing up, you tell yourself, I'm never going to be like you. I, th you. You're ridiculous. You don't know what you're talking about. I'm never going to be like you when I'm old, when I have my own family, my own kids and make my own money and I do my own stuff. I, I'm going to do all the things that I see you doing wrong. And every single day, I look at things in my life and I think, oh, no, I'm becoming my father. And we do. We become like our father. We become like our mother. We, we become like whoever that paternal kind of figure is in our life. And so we, we have this family tree and you're just an apple on it. But that apple is connected to the whole tree. And that tree becomes really important because... An apple tree, your family tree, an apple tree is going to produce apples. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. But you're not, it's not going to produce an orange. And all of a sudden, the orange is going to pop off the tree and roll down the hill and be really far away. You don't find an orange 100 meters from an apple tree and say, I wonder how that orange fell off that tree, rolled down the hill and got to this place. That doesn't make sense. In the same way, the family tree is the same. See, you can look at your family tree your aunts, your uncles, your cousins, all those people. And you can say, this is kind of where I'm headed in life. These are the parts of my life that are, gonna, that are being influenced by those people. In fact, there's a really smart guy, a guy named Murray Bowen. Now, this guy here, Mr. Murray, Dr. Murray, he's a psychiatrist. And what he did is he started to pioneer this idea uh, that, that really focused around the family tree, started to look at, at people's family trees and why do people behave the way they do? Why do certain traits get passed down from generation to generation? And he came up with this, this at, at first it was an idea and he really started to pioneer it. And now it's kind of known pretty solidly in, in a lot of circles as these genograms. 
And a, a genogram is something that you either don't know anything about or you've drank all the juice and you're all in on this thing. And in your chair right now, you're saying, yeah, he's talking about it. Yes, I'm so excited because I've done this. You know, my wife is one of these people. And to do this correctly, there's symbols and there's all kinds of stuff with it. But, but it's, it's actually really, really in line with what God made and how God made us and how God made family. So I, I want to unpack what this is. This is, this, I didn't pull this from the Bible. This is from his research, from his literature, but this is what it includes. And this is important because this isn't something that he's made up. He's figured out without even knowing it, a truth that God has made us with. So he's exposing the intricacies of how God has made us. It's kind of like, like a, an eye surgeon when they do surgery and they find out that LASIK can repair your vision, it's not like that eye surgeon has invented something new. He has just rolled back and found out and discovered and exposed the miracle of God's creation and how God created somebody to even have a way to fix that. I mean, it's, that's what's happening here. So this is what he's, what he's done. So this genogram, it includes information about the relationships between family members, so you and other family members, it adds their medical histories. It adds sociological and psychological data to that. So it's looking at all kinds of different things. Medical history, sociological and psychological data, relationships between you and your families. It's taking a big picture. And then what it does from there is this can actually illustrate, Josh, next slide, please, that you can actually illustrate the complex family dynamics and patterns over multiple generations. Okay, so think about that. Over multiple generations of family members, by doing this genogram, they can start to illustrate. So you can see and follow these patterns, these, these very complex dynamics, such as recurring health conditions, such as behavioral patterns, or even emotional relationships. So it starts to uncover quite a bit that we can discover here through this thing. Then it goes on here to say that genograms that are used in medicine, psychology, social work, genealogy, genetic research, and education. So this doesn't just apply in one area. They're using the family tree in all of these areas. And in using those, specifically in medicine and psychology, they can identify patterns of mental and physical illnesses that might have a genetic component. I mean, to me, that's quite amazing. They're pulling a lot of data just from looking at your family tree. And then in therapy, there's another added element to it in therapy. Genograms can help individuals understand their family, understand the family dynamics, patterns of behavior, and how these have influenced their current attitudes and interactions. So what this does to me, and what this really awakened in me is this reality of, Man, there is, there is so much that God has embedded into the family dynamic, into our family tree. There's actually a lot of meat there for us. There's a lot going on there. You don't just sort of accidentally exist in this family unit somewhere and it has no impact on you and the next generation and the next generation. The, the point that I want to make in this is that a man accidentally, well, maybe accidentally on purpose, but he stumbled into the ability to uncover so much about us just by looking at our family tree, what's passed down from one generation to the next generation and to the next generation. And so the very important point that I want to illustrate to you this morning is this, and it's kind of a hard one. It's actually a bit sobering. It's one I typed out and I deleted and I typed it and I deleted it. And then I said, no, this, this is a very real sobering piece of data for us. So not only can I tell you based on these genograms, not only can I tell you everything about where and who you came from, sins and all, I can tell you with reliable certainty what you will become. There is almost no mystery to who you will become. I could look at, I could take any of you in this room and pluck you out and do a genogram on you and your whole family and, and not tell you anything and do it in the background and you would know that it's happening and I could map out 
with reliable certainty what the rest of your life is going to end up looking like. And it's almost, almost 100% accurate. It'll tell you it, uh, how prone you are to heart disease or to diabetes or to um, how prone you are to mental, um, uh, mental health issues or being impacted by other people's mental health. It'll tell you how good you are at relationships. It'll tell you how good you are at destroying and wrecking relationships. It'll tell you everything that you think is a secret or a mystery or that you get to just learn how to become. I can tell you now that there is almost no mystery to who you will become because the pathway is already there. The family tree is already there. And from that family tree, we're living out this life right now that's connected to this root system that is this tree. And so what we've got to do is th this is a point in this message where we have to recognize the good, the bad, and the ugly. All right, so we have things in our life that are good. You've got things that were passed down to you that were great. When I look at Casey's family and her grandmother, she passed down an enormous capacity to love no matter what. No matter how, how much someone's life was put together or not put together, this lady would love you to death. And that passed down to Casey. You know why that was important that that passed down to Casey? Because she would marry me. Yes. And God knew that I would need that. And guess what? I do. So, so just in that, in, in 30 seconds, I can display it even in my own life. In one instance, this was passed down from Casey's grandmother to Casey, and then it's passed down to me. And now when I look at my kids and they make mistakes or they do wrong things, the first thing that pops into my mind is the idea that Casey loves me despite my failures. It's getting passed down. See, that's the good. But see, also what gets passed down to us is, is these other things, these bad things, these things that end up feeling like that they're chains that are left on us. You know, it's, I, I'm sorry, if your great-great-grandfather is an alcoholic and your great-grandfather is an alcoholic and your grandfather is an alcoholic and your dad is an alcoholic and you're now 18 years old and you think you can just walk into a bar and have one beer not going to happen because that alcoholism has just been passed down from generation to generation to generation to generation. Now, a lot of people look at these things as things like, like generational curses. I, I don't necessarily believe in generational curses. I don't believe that a sin that my great grandfather committed, that I'm having to pay penance for that now. But what I do believe is generational characteristics and that, that characteristic and that great grandfather what drove him to alcoholism? And if that never gets resolved, then that gets passed down, and that gets passed down, and that gets passed down. I can prove that to you. Why is it that the, the number one group of people that abuse people are people that have been abused? See, what I would think is that we would look at our lives and we would say, all this stuff's coming down and happening to me, and you know what? I'm going to categorize it. This is good. Keep it. Bad, throw it out. Keep this, throw it out. Keep this, throw the bad out. Okay, now I've portioned. I've thrown out all the bad cards in the deck. And now all I have left in me is what's good. So I'm just going to take this pile of good and I'm going to turn around and I'm just going to repeat the good. And so over time, this thing is going to become distilled down. In five generations from now, I'm going to have perfect children and a perfect family. And we are going to be just this amazingly good group of people. That, that, that's what logic would tell me. Why? with someone that watches their family throw everything away because of a gambling addiction or because of an addiction to pornography or because of infidelity or because of, uh, uh, of a history of abuse. Why would you watch that happen and then turn around and repeat it? Why would you let something that hurt you so badly impact you to the point that you turn around and the first thing you do is you repeat it in your generation or the generation under you? The reason is, is because there's absolutely no mystery to who you're going to become because these, these generational things, they come with us. The good and the bad and the ugly. And some of us have things in our life, especially this ugly part where we're terrified that somebody is going to find out about something that happened previously in our family or previously in our life. We're terrified. 
You know what? There, there's a lot of ugly in a lot of our history. A lot of ugly in our current situations that we're going through right now. So what we have is we have some hard truths that we have to accept before we move on this morning. Truth number one that we've got to accept is that there is significance to the family unit. The whole world is trying to destroy the family unit and say that it doesn't matter. Even if all those people, even if the family unit is destroyed, it, it's, it's, still, it, I mean, it's still a family unit in God's eyes. It still is what it is. You know, a, a pack of cookies that you step on is still a pack of cookies. It doesn't, it doesn't change that. The, God's looking down and saying, you guys are running around and you're trying to rearrange how things work together and how things fit together, but I still kind of see you guys as a family. You guys are still a, a family unit. And there's significance to that. We've got to accept that, you know what, there is significance to the fact that I have people that came before me and that there are people that are with me and that uh, there will be people that come after me. There is great significance in that. We also have to accept that, you know what, we take a lot of the bad things and we transfer it down to the generation below us. And we have a lot of good things that we wish that we could transfer down and we maybe don't always take that with us. So we have to all very introspectively look at our lives. Now, I, I've had the luxury of pre-doing all this this week. So it's not hit me like a bomb. But I've looked at my life and I've said, okay, I know, I can see in my life where some good stuff has filtered down, where some bad stuff has filtered down. I can see where I've, where I've let go and I can see where I've held on. And I can see that I am who I am because of the impact of the family tree that sits above me. Now, Jesus was not immune to this. Jesus was also very much uh, a part of this. Now, I'm going to read a story to you. And this story comes from the, the book of Mark. And in this story, Jesus is subjected to the characterization that his family would put him in. So Jesus goes to his hometown. He goes back to Nazareth, where he's from. This is like his, his, the local pub, the local bar. They know him. They know his family. This is where his brothers, his sisters live. And Jesus goes back there. And it's where you're known the most that oftentimes your identity is so hard for you to feel like you can change it. See, where, where your hometown is, where your house is, where your family is, wherever it is that you lay your head at night, that's where sometimes it feels the most impossible for something to change, the most impossible for something to break free or break off. And Jesus illustrates that for us right here. He says this in, in Mark, in chapter 6, 1 and 3. He says, Jesus left there. He'd just done amazing miracles somewhere else. And Jesus had, had walked and he went to Nazareth, his hometown. And he shows up and he walks into town and his disciples, they follow him there. And then the Sabbath rolls around. That's a Saturday. And he goes into the temple. And he would have been given an opportunity to, to teach or really it would have been maybe reading the word. And he gets that opportunity in the synagogue. And many who listened to him, they were astonished. They hear Jesus speak. They know Jesus. They know Jesus' family tree. And they're astonished goes on and, and he says, they're saying, where did this man, where? So where is like, how did, why does, where did this happen? Because this isn't the Jesus that we know. And it's not like, oh, I'm now surprised and amazed. It's like, well, wait a minute. Where's this guy coming from here? Where does he get off coming in here and teaching and talking like he is something that he's not? That's not, that's not the Jesus that we know. So he says, where did this man get these things? This knowledge, the spiritual insight, he shouldn't have that. What is this wisdom, which is this confident understanding of Scripture that has been given to him? So now they've questioned everything. Jesus, where did you get this? Jesus, why do you have what you call this, this knowledge, this wisdom? We, we don't believe it. We don't trust it. And then they go on and then they say, and, and such miracles as these performed by his hands. So they've heard the stories about him and they're saying, what, what is this? Like, bro, this, we know your tree. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. You, th there's no Messiah tree above you. So we, don't, we don't understand why you're claiming this. And they actually say, is this not the carpenter? See, Jesus was walking around and said, I'm the son of God. They said, no, you're the carpenter. You're the builder. That's your identity, not miracle maker, 
Not, not person who heals people, not person who forgives sin, not person who walks on water, none of that. You are just the builder, the son of Mary. You know what's so interesting? In Jewish culture, to refer to somebody as the son of the, the wife was an insult to them. Because what would have been proper would have said, you're the son of Joseph. They said, no, you're the son of Mary. They're insulting him, even in, in who they're calling his identity to be. They say, you're a carpenter. You're a son of Mary. And, and we know your brother James and Joseph and Judas and Simon. And are your, are your sisters also not here with us? So they're questioning him. And they, they finish up their, their questions with him. And they say, and they were deeply offended by him. Has anyone ever been offended when you've tried to elevate yourself? When you've tried to make yourself better? And then you show up at home and someone says, what are you doing? Quit, quit believing in this lie that you're going to change your life or become better because you're not. You're a carpenter. You're a son of Mary. That's all, you, that's all you are. That's the tree that's above you here. And the fact that you would even so boldly think that you could become more or better than that, Jesus, because you would even think that, we are absolutely offended at you for that. And so they're offended. And what's happening is their disapproval, it blinded them from the fact that he was anointed by God as the Messiah. See, you, you see here that even Jesus runs up against the issue of the family tree. That, that Jesus, the guy that turned water into wine, the guy that had just left performing three other miracles, just boom, 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 back to back. One of them was that he, he, he healed somebody who was said to be dead. He just walks out of that situation and walks into his hometown and they just knock him down at the knees. They humble him super quick. Say, hold on, this is who you are. If Jesus can't escape it, then neither can you and neither can I. You know, I, I had the realization that I can't run from my family tree. I'm not going to stand up here and say to you, like, you know what, cut your tree down and set it on fire and burn it. That's not the right thing to do. You can't just burn every relationship that came before you. You can't cut down every relationship that you have with a father, a mother, a brother, an uncle, a cousin, an aunt, whoever it is. You can't cut that down and throw it on the fire and let it just burn and then walk away and start something new. It doesn't work that way. You can't run from your tree. You can't run from what has been passed down to you. We can't hide from that either. And many of us do try and hide. Let me move to a different place. Let me redefine myself, okay? I've blown it over here with this group of friends. Now they know, okay, I'm gonna totally leave them. Let me come over here and join this group. All right, so I'm here, fresh start. Three months in, I repeat a bad behavior. Okay, you know what? Let me come over here, another new group of friends. You know, some of us live our lives that way. We hide, we run, next, next, next. And then when you look over your shoulder, you find that you've, you've got a real legacy of emptiness behind you because you tried to run from your family tree. You can't run from it and you can't cut it down. So when we're faced with those realities, with, with, with those, those unexcusable realities that we are impacted by something that we had no control over, I had no control that I would be born to Gary and Sherry Ladd on June 5th, 1983 at 4 p.m. I had no control over that. It happened to me. And then the rest of my life, up to a point, happened to me. So much of who I am happened to me, formed me, developed me before I even had any say-so in it. So, so we, this not, it's not something that we can avoid or that we can run from. So what do we do? See, this is the part where it does get exciting. This is something that was revealed to me years and years and years and years ago. This is our, our escape hatch. This is how we do change it. This is how I can, I can tell you today that when we walk out of here, everything that you don't want to carry, you don't have to carry anymore. Everything that you want to break, every bondage, every chain, every bad thing, you can break it and we can walk out of here today completely, completely free from it. And the way that we do that is through this one word, it's through sonship. And we talk about sonship here. Sonship, it also, when we talk about it in the Bible, it means adoption. And see, remember, I don't want you to forget that never in any of this are we changing the way that God created the family tree to work. That never changes. 
But what God ends up doing is he ends up giving us a way to graft into a new tree. And he does that through sonship and through adoption. In fact, in the Bible, when it uses the word adoption, it's a Roman word. And, and here's what this, this means. It, it reflects this illegal term. And so as sons, we are adopted into the family of God. And by being adopted into the family of God, it's a legal status change. It includes a new family, a new name, new privileges. And the adoptee was fully and permanently part of the new family. You know, that, that in a Roman context would have been, you know, you were adopted out of slavery and then adopted into this family. It totally changed your life. But that same thing happens today. I can be adopted out of the slavery that is the bad and the good and the ugly that was passed down to me in my life. I can be adopted out of that and I can be adopted into a brand new family tree. And what happens there, what that's called, is that's called me just giving my life to Jesus. Me becoming a Christian. Now, when I become a Christ follower, I'm recognizing, God, I am a broken person. I come from broken people. I'm a person that doesn't have it all together. I'm not super happy with what I've learned to carry from the generations before me. I kind of would like to let some of that go. I kind of would like to stop living in what I feel like is bondage. I would like to get out of the, I wish things could be different and get into the, now I'm equipped and can see how things can be different and I can also make a change for the generations that come after me. And if that's something that you're interested in, it's very easy to do. It's called you give your life to Jesus. You say, Jesus, I want you to be my Lord. I want you to forgive me of my sins and I no longer have to carry it. And see, when you're adopted as a Christian, in fact, you could even say a, a Christian, a Christ follower is, is this. It's one who has been adopted into sonship by God, You've been adopted by God. Remember that Roman legal term? That means that you inherit everything that is God's. You become everything that is God's. You are adopted and you get with that adoption the fullness of the inheritance of what that adoptive parent is giving you. So we've been adopted by God. We're brought into the family of God and it's by the sacrifice of the Son of God. Also that everything about us can change. See, in the beginning, that hard truth that I gave you was that with great certainty, I could predict your future based on your geneogram, based on your family tree. And, and that's true. I, I really can. The part that I can't predict is, is the moment that you have to say, I don't want to be bound by these chains that have been on my family for generation after generation after generation. I'm no longer going to let abuse or alcoholism. I'm no longer going to let infidelity. I'm no longer going to let pride. I'm no longer going to let depression be passed down and watch it consume generation after generation and generation. And I can't make that change. But if I'm adopted... If I get a new father and I get everything that comes with that father, then I go from nothing being able to change to now every single thing about me being able to change. So we can't run from our tree. We can't chop it down and get rid of it. But what we can do is we can change our tree. We can be grafted into a new tree. And see, God's tree, his, his tree of life, his tree of truth, his tree of salvation, it's got plenty of room for all of us. And it will never run out of branches. And so today, you have an opportunity to, to make a claim. Are, are, the question is, is that are you ready to break a chain? Are, are you ready for that? Are you ready to end a streak? Are you ready to stop a pattern? Are you ready to plant a new tree? It, it's really simple today, guys. It, it was this simple to me probably 20 years ago, the first time I heard someone talk about this, where I thought all I have to do is, is just 
let myself be adopted by God? I don't have to repeat all of these things that, have been, that, that I've seen consume my family. I, I don't have to. And you know what's also great is I know that my children don't have to be slaves to my mistakes because they also get an opportunity to be adopted into the family of God. See, that, that to me is, is what's so beautiful about this is that everyone gets an opportunity today to end a streak to stop a pattern or to plant a new tree, to graft yourself in to the tree of life. You know how they do that when they graft, when they, when they bring plants and trees together? They, they cut a little bit of you off, a, a good bit of you, the good part, the part that shows promise. They, See, this is, I'll tell you what, it's emotional for me because I know that God is doing it in someone here. See, my, my, my tree's done. I'm, I'm grafted. I'm good. I, when I look back and I think about that moment where God cut away all the dead and he got rid of the bad and he took it's just a little bit of me that was good. And, and then he took his tree and he cuts a little notch and he just stuck me in there and he tied a rope around. And then out of that, a new tree, new fruit was produced. See, I'm settled in that. And that, that to me is something I don't ever question again. But I, the reason I, if you're new here, you know, I get emotional on stage when I know that the Holy Spirit is working and that somebody here is right on the edge of a moment of saying, do I really believe this or not? And I just want to encourage you to believe in it, to let God cut away all the bad. Let God just take that little bit of you that's good and graft that into his tree. I, I want to read to you a verse in Galatians. And, and th this is what Paul talks about when Paul talks about adoption. Paul says this in Galatians 4, he says, But when in God's plan, the proper time had fully come, God, he sent his son, born of a woman, born under the regulations of law, so that he might redeem and liberate those who were underneath the law. So that's, that's us. And then he goes on, and that whoever might believe can be adopted as sons, as God's children, with all rights, as fully grown members of a family, all the rights as fully grown members of God's family. And he goes on in the last bit here, he says, and because you really are his sons, God really has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. You know what's great about this word, Abba? This word, Abba, is, is Aramaic for the way a little child would say, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. That, that's what that word means. Isn't that just beautiful. So I hope that you see opportunity coming out of this. And Paul goes on here and he finishes it off and he says, therefore, and this is for you to claim today, you who's sitting out there on the fence right now, who my soul is in a battle for you. And I wish you'd make a decision so that the Holy Spirit would leave me alone so I can stop being emotional but someone is in a battle. And I'm here to tell you that, that therefore you are no longer a slave, but you're a son. And if a son, then also an heir through the gracious act of God through Christ. So what that means for you is that you are an heir, meaning that Paul promises us three things. And that God promises us these three things. Intimacy with God, inheritance, and transformation by the Holy Spirit. Intimacy with God means that when you accept this and you don't think it's going to work, or you go home today for lunch and somebody calls you son of Mary or the carpenter rather than calls you by what you've claimed today. That, and I know that's your fear, that the intimacy of God sits with you and says, hey, 
it's okay. Remember, I'm your daddy. Remember, you're my family. You don't have to hear it. You don't have to claim it. We're building a new thing over here. This inheritance is that really we should inherit just the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. You know, what's amazing about this inheritance is God is saying, it doesn't matter where your apple lands or what tree it falls from, it gets picked up by the heavenly father and it is the perfect fruit. And then this idea of transformation by the Holy Spirit, you know, the Holy Spirit, for those of you that don't know the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is God's helper. What the Holy Spirit does is it helps you in ways that, that you don't really know how to help yourself. God sent a helper to help you with your relationship with Jesus. And this is one of those moments where you probably need help. I know it's one of the moments where I needed help. And so for you that's out there that's saying, I don't know. I don't know that I can do this. I don't know that I can accept this. I don't know. You've got a helper. Don't turn the helper down because the Holy Spirit is there. It's there to give us intimacy with God inheritance everything that's God's is ours and transformation through the greatest helper that we could ever be given and so what I want to give us an opportunity to do this morning is um, is before we go out and we have coffee and life happens I know at least one person in here has has just struggled with believing this this morning. Otherwise, I would have had a lot more fun if it wasn't for you. If you could have just made a decision at the beginning. But I love you. I I really care about all of you. And I want to see you live in this freedom. This guarantee of what it's like to be adopted into the inheritance of God. And so when when Kurt comes out, he's going to lead us in a song. And in that moment, we've got our prayer partners that will come up front. And listen, these are people that we've handpicked. They're private. They're respectful. They're uh, extremely mature, wonderful, unjudging people. And they know how to, how to, they know how to be for you. What you don't know how to be for you right now which is just a hug and a prayer and some support. Now I say all the time, there's a lot of magic, there's there's a lot of power when you can confess something with your own mouth. When you say it with your own lips, it's one thing to sit in your seat and think it. It's another thing to come right out and say it. And when you say it, you claim it. When you speak it, you claim it. You speak it into truth. And these moments of prayer, this, this moment with a prayer partner is set up just for that. You may need just one minute to come down and grab somebody off to the side and just say, I've, today is my day where I claim that I'm a son of God, where I, I claim that I'm grafted into his tree. And this is your opportunity to do that. And so if you don't feel like you can come down front, then as Kurt uh, leads us in a song, then I hope this is a moment for you to reflect on what we've talked about, a moment for you to connect with God who just is trying to tell you, like, hey, I'm here for you. You don't have to continue in this generational thing. You can let go of all that. It's time to graft you into a new tree.